It's good worship right there. I um, yeah. I um, I wanted to just start today, if I could. I'm going to jump down here. Was that heavier today this week or something? <laughs> the spirit of heaviness. Come on. <laughs> Hi, Scott. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> um. The joy of the Lord is your strength, just so you know. It's the joy of the Lord is your strength. So. <laughs> Before I get started, uh, hey, kids, where are you? You're not here? They're here somewhere? You're just, let's just pray for our kids. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for them. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for the gift that they are to us. We just, we're so blessed that you have um, saw fit to trust us with these amazing children. So Father, I pray that they would so sense your presence um, during the time they have together today that the teachers would speak um, um, words of edification, encouragement, that they would speak prophetically and call things into their lives and out of their lives that are, that are sitting there waiting to just be harvested. Um, Father, bring their identity up into their focus in such a way, Father, that at an early age, they not only know your voice and sense your heart and, and sense your direction, but they begin to immediately begin to refine that, it, that you've something they've already put in them in the development. They can even begin to mature right now and teach us a few things. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Have fun, kids, have fun. <clears throat> with, that, with that said, um, I just wanted to share with you a little, a little, a little joke this morning because this is always the most important part of my message, anyways. Um, and that, and and anybody ever argue with your wife or your husband over the fact of who's supposed to make the coffee this morning? Nobody ever has an argument over that. So guys, you just yield and you submit to your wives and those type of things. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. So, so, so I just I heard this story, and it's not my wife and I. But I heard this story of a husband and a wife who were arguing over who should be making the coffee. And, and, and the wife just got tired of hearing him complaining about him having to make the coffee. And she said, I'm going to give you biblical proof that the guy is supposed to make the coffee. I'm going to show you a bill. So I'm going to do the same thing for you right now. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 6, chapter 6, um, just a good word, especially for coffee drinker ladies. Um, I want to talk about, there, there's, there's something that I have been very concerned about with the church in America specifically, and that is this, is that the discussion of basic principles of doctrine are never left. There, um, let me say it another way. There are theologies that are gone over and gone over and preached about and preached about and discussed in churches and discussed in small groups and discussed in, 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 in you know, sit down and have a cup of coffee. There are things that we are still arguing about that he says, settle that thing and let's move on. And Hebrews 6 declares what those things are. So I want to I I qualify this by saying that we don't leave the principles of Christ behind, but we leave the discussions of the principles of Christ and move on to another discussion that is built upon the principles of Christ. Yes? Okay, so he, let me just give you the word on, on that because this is the word for our house. Um, and it should be the word for every house, honestly. But in the American church, it's safe to talk about principles that don't challenge you in your current status. It, see, in churches, what we want to do is we want to talk about a resurrection that is to come rather than the resurrection is him today. You know, we want to build a theology that we can believe in for tomorrow that we're not willing to accept in the moment. You know, we, 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 want, we don't have enough faith to step in the reality of the today when today is a day of salvation, we say, I'll wait till tomorrow. You know, because it's easy to build a theology that will say that Jesus is coming rather than that he is here. Do you, does that make sense? All of us want to build a theology that says, I believe that God can, but none of us wants to take the risk that God will. 
we want to work for victory rather than working from it. We want to work to gain heaven rather than working from heaven. You see, and it's just, I just want to take us to the place that, that he is actually available in the now, not just in the future. That, that everything that he has for us in the age to come is actually available in the age now. And, I'm, and, and that's all derived from this that we're going to read right here, right now. Hebrews chapter 6. It says, therefore, leaving the discussion, and I emphasize the discussion, of the elementary principles of Christ. How many know the Holy Spirit would never say, leave the elementary principles of Christ? He goes, but there's something, there's, there's, there's something about truth that shouldn't be left, but there's something about truth that a greater truth should be built on it. Foundation is for the purpose of building something on not just to be left dormant in itself, okay? So, so, so the elementary principle of Christ, let us go on to what? Perfection, or if you would, maturity, not laying again the foundation of these things. We don't need to be laying again the foundation of repentance. There are so many people that spend their lives sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, when the reality is we were a sinner that was saved by grace, but now we actually are a saint, we're a priest, we're a king of the Most High God. And see, the problem is when you think you are something, you act that way. So all of us live in this place, well, I'll never ever be a saint, so I justify me sinning. When the reality is grace was put there not to grace was put there not to help us sin, grace was put there to help us not sin, but to go on to maturity and stop thinking like a child. <laughs> so so these elementary principles of Christ laying the foundation again, the foundation of repentance. There's some churches you go to every week all you hear is a salvation message. I'm not against the salvation message, but it's the beginning of a kingdom that has no end. And so you can't just be, let's not keep, okay, man, you got a foundation. You got it. It's a foundation of repentance. Now let's build our life on a life of repentance, not a one-time act of repentance. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We stay in that place, God, I just honor you. I just love you. Now I keep my focus on you. I don't think about the past, but I press on to the mark of the highest calling that's ahead of me, and I just keep stepping. Why, why, why can I keep on stepping? Because I know if I keep my eyes set on you, that you actually ordain my steps, and I don't have to walk in fear except for the one that I fear the most, which is you. And it's because I respect you, I adore you, I love you, because you are just amazing. Yeah. How many know that foundations are not that pretty to look at? They're not meant to be pretty. They're meant to be foundations. They're meant to hold something, okay? So the principles of Christ are meant to hold something, but the, most people never build beyond the foundation, so the world never actually sees what you're carrying because it's underground. Watch this. A repentance from dead works and a faith towards God. How many of those are both good things? And of the doctrine of baptism. Aren't you glad we've had water baptism? We've had the baptism of salvation. We've had the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad we have those things? But there's been so much dialogue and debate and discussions over those things that the world looks at us and say, what are they talking about? See, because the world's not going to recognize that we're Christians by our baptism or our doctrines or our discussions. The world's actually going to know that we're Christians by our love. You see... <laughs> In the culture of honor, we're really, we're, really, we're really identifying and, if you would, defining what that culture is in our house. And it's literally this. It's literally this. In a culture of honor, as the definition, the actual intention is this. You have a body of believers that are actually covenant people. And covenant means that you do life together till death do us part. Yeah. Pastor Scott, well, that's not possible in this day and age. People are moving from this place to that place. All right. right. Okay, let's say you're only gonna be there for three and a half years. Then live in, live in covenant with those people for three and a half years as though you're gonna be there forever. Does that make sense? Well, I don't know what next year holds. Well, that's okay. You live this year as though this is your last. I mean, you'd stay in that place. Why? Because covenant is what actually produces heaven and earth. Okay, so covenant, let me define it another way. Every, every relationship that you have, or culture of honor, if I could, every relationship, every connection that you have, you actually should guard and protect. Yeah. Every single relationship. Every, a, a culture of honor says, I want to guard this, I want to protect it. What happens if it gets broken? I want to fix it. Yeah. See, that's a covenant relationship. Tell me something. When your marriage gets broken, do you walk away from it? 
The answer to that should be no. In our culture, too many times, when it gets difficult, it doesn't feel good anymore, and you feel like you've fallen out of love, we break covenant relationship all the time because of what our preferences are. Listen, anybody ever been down that road, and you've been divorced, and you've had, um, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, but love is greater than all of that. And thank God, listen, when the one was caught in adultery, I heard somebody say, I think I read it on Facebook this week, um, somebody said, um, him, without the first so- st- him without sin cast the first stone, but they forgot the rest of it. And now that you have been free, go and sin no more. <laughs> See, we don't want anybody casting stones at us, but we also have been empowered to sin no more. Go from it, walk away from it, be empowered, let the Holy Spirit come and move you out of that situation into a greater one. Glory to glory to glory to glory. In fact, it's great when you go from a devastation that the enemy meant for destruction into something good that God intended for you. You know, and then you start the glory trip. So culture of honor is protect those relationships. If they're broken, fix those relationships and protect this thing called covenant with your husband, with your wife, with your children, and with the body that God's placed you with. Nurture those. I'm supposed to be giving my little spiel on my connect group, but I wanna tell you something. That's the places where relationships are really formed. It's difficult to form relationships in a corporate setting. And I I just gotta be honest with you. Um, Lisa and I, I think we're becoming um, great leaders as far as for a house. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but I'm saying it to say this. we're not, we've, we're finding our anointing is not to be great friends. How many know that Jesus could speak to 12 things that he could not speak to thousands? There's a place, Jesus was limited. He said, I have to go away so I can send the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I'm limited in my humanity in who I can reach and who I can impact and who I can empower. So I've got to go away and send the Holy Spirit so you'll be able to do greater things than I did when I was on the earth. And how many know in three and a half years, he did more miracle signs and wonders that the libraries of the world couldn't contain everything that he did. And then he's going to say to us with that resume, you're going to do greater things than I did. Well, I'm telling you, the only way I believe that we can ever do greater things as he did is to actually model the life that he lived where he said that I can do nothing without my father, where he said I can say nothing except for what my father is saying, where he said I have become a servant and a servant to all. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you got to learn to become the least. And it's when we become completely dependent upon the father and not independent of the father or his body is actually when the power of God is actually released in us because that independent spirit has to be broken over a people so that a dependent spirit that is dependent completely on the Father and upon each other, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and loving each other, covenant relationship with him, and covenant relationship with each other, that actually heaven can come to earth into our situations. And that's just the foundations. (laughs) What's going to happen when we can move on from those foundation pieces? But see, we haven't even learned to embrace the foundation stuff yet. We haven't learned, watch, let me give you some more. The doctrine of baptisms. Hey, watch this, laying on of hands. How are we doing with just having what we have and sharing it with somebody else? My experience becoming your experience. My encounter becoming your encounter. My joy becoming your joy. My grief becoming your grief and vice versa. See, In Matthew, in Matthew 28, we just did Easter, so it's kind of fresh to me. But in Matthew 28, Jesus is raised from the dead. And Jesus gets raised from the dead and Mary is on her way to the tomb. There was a couple of them. They're were, they were on their way to the tomb And when they get to the tomb, they find that the stone is rolled away. Now, can I ask you something? Do you think that Jesus actually needed the stone to be rolled away for him to come out of the tomb? So why was the stone rolled away? Huh? So that actually we could go in and see the miracle that just took place. You see, 
I, I found that interesting in Matthew 28. It says that uh, the stone was rolled away and the angel was sitting on it. Yeah. How many know that every obstacle in your life that the enemy man means to stop you from seeing your miracle, that the angel actually wants to roll that stone away and sit on top of it, and God's kingdom is actually established on those obstacles that want to stop you from your experience and from your miracle. But let, let me, with that said, with that said, how many know that if you only depend on your experiences to establish something in you, that you'll have an independent spirit that can be established. Jesus rebuked 10 disciples for not believing what two had seen. Now, he didn't rebuke the 10 disciples. Let me tell you the story. Mary and the other Mary, Mary and Mary, 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 quite contrary. They're all there, and, 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 the, and, and the angel says, go tell my disciples what you've seen. But the angel said, but Jesus is already on his way to Galilee. And on the way, he actually stops and interacts with who? Two of the disciples. So now the Marys, Mary squared, and the disciples go and they tell the other disciples what just happened. And what did the 10 disciples do? Can I, can I just say something to you? Sometimes God gives an encounter and experience to someone for the purpose of actually having it deposited and imparted into your life, but the reason you never experienced it is because you don't believe the fact that the one who it was given to actually was legitimate. And so what happens is you are always restricted. You are always restricted from God because you're restricted from his body. An independent spirit will say, unless I have a personal encounter or a personal experience, I can't believe your testimony. When the testimony was meant for the purpose of encouraging, when you come together, tell each other of the things that the Lord is doing. Share a, 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 a word. Give a, give a testimony. Say a word of encouragement, of exhortation. Come together and share. Why? Because your experience should infuse something of that inside of me that will awaken something that will have me pursue my own experience in God. But it doesn't see, so many times we're just like, we become doubters. And, I, and, I, and I've, been, I've been watching, I don't know what I'm talking about today yet for sure, but I know we're going somewhere. Sometime this is gonna make sense. Um, um, I, I, I've been thinking about my life, and, this, and today is not about me, but it's like, I just wanna share with you uh, a process. Uh, um, and I confirm this in scripture. How many know it's good to confirm things in scripture? Because um, you know, otherwise it could be stupid. Um, but I, <laughs> I've been known for stupid. Um, but in the last 10 years of my life, I started off on this journey of pursuing Christ 15 years, 14, 15 years, maybe, maybe two years. I don't know, it's somewhere, somewhere in there. <laughs> but I, I started out, can I just be honest with you? I started out afraid of most things that were heaven. I, I was afraid. When I remember, I remember Jim and Judy Horton, um, I don't know if they're in here. They're serving. Judy's not serving, she's sitting. She's right there. Um, but she's sitting serving. She's serving while she's sitting. Um, so Judy, I mean, I remember this, you know, and I don't know if you ever had this conversation, but we invited you guys to a praise rally one time. Um, and we were going up, we were going up north. And uh, we, I, I mean, I've never been right in what to expect. You know, how many know sometimes you go into church, some things happen that you don't expect? See, if, if you go to church and you only always get what you expect, you've actually gone to McDonald's. <laughs> I went to this amazing restaurant the other night and they said, listen, when we go there, you don't know what you're gonna get because they have a different menu every night, but the chef is amazing. How many of that brings an excitement to you? You know, as long as you know that the chef is amazing and you don't even need to understand the words on the menu, you know it's gonna taste good. And I just sat there and I said, I'll take one of those. I don't know why I can't, I can't say it, but I'll take one of those. I, I ate these um, oysters that weren't cooked. It tastes like some things that, never mind. I, I've had a cold lately. And oh, no. No, so anyway, <laughs> just kidding. But, but, but I, I, what was I saying? Where was I? McDonald's. What you expect before that, huh? If you go to church, the church. Oh, North. Church. 
Praise right. Judy, Judy Horton sitting there serving. That's right. I'm back, I'm back now. Um, but I remember taking Judy and Jim to this praise rally, and we got into this place, and, um, and um, it was a little radical, to be honest with you. And I, I walked in, and, and uh, all of a sudden, the flags came out. I don't know if you've ever been in a church where they have flags, but the flags come out. Now, now I'm not afraid of flags until they almost hit me. And I'm, in, I'm here in the front row, and the flag, I called her the flag lady. The flag lady came running across, and she's going, whoo, whoo, whoo. Well, I didn't know that the flag actually had a pole attached to it, too. And so she's swinging this flag, and I'm going, whoa. Number 277, number 277, your, your bagel's ready. Number 277, or your baby's ready. Um, so these flags, but I remember just being, I was horrified for Jim and Judy because they had just come in to the kingdom. I'm mean, oh, they're, this is it, they're done. They're quitting on God right now, they're done. They're, the flags are gonna push them away. I know the flags are gonna push them away. And I just, I remember just seeing those flags and going, you know, going, you know. I, I was, and it wasn't a Holy Spirit moment going like this. It was like one of those, I had to dodge to miss the thing coming, it was coming. But I remember, I remember in the early days, I mean, when somebody would raise their hands and I had, Brendan, can I just be honest with you, the first time I had you come to church, bro, oh, and we had Marianne Brown. Remember Marianne Brown? And, uh, and, and man, and you came, you came, and I'm like, oh, Brendan, that's it. Brendan's leaving the church. He's leaving the, he's not, he doesn't want, he wants anything to do with this. Time. And Marianne Brown's just going, C -c 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 come on. And like just bringing stuff, and she's shaking stuff. She's 78 years old. I don't know how old she was. She's, she's a shunda baka laka chaka maka, whatever she's doing. And Brent, and Brendan's just like, Brendan's going, oh my Lord, what am I going to, you know, and, and he's just like, I'm going, oh, he's done. I got to go explain to him this at Hilliard now. We got to go down and have a cup of coffee. And I gotta go through the whole thing. Well, this is what took place, and that's what that was. And I just gotta be, I was always afraid of that kind of stuff. Somebody raising their hands or somebody dancing, you know. We had this lady in our church, she said she had the whole five-fold ministry all herself. And then and, and all the gifts. Yeah, she walked in all the gifts. So I said, So what do you need the body for? But anyways, I just went, but she would be up here, man, and she all of a sudden she'd just start. She had that move going on. Like we say, oh sister, you know, you really got to watch the hips. You got to stop with the hips. You know, you can, you can, you can, you can dance from like here on up, but don't. Those hips got to stay planted. You can't let those hips go. And so, so, I'm just, I'm saying all that. I'm just saying, I'm saying all that because, because the Lord has taken me. The Lord has taken me on this, on this journey over the last ten years, um, where where I have, I've been, I've become less easily offended or less, less easily distracted by the expression of other people of how they worship God. Um, Jacob, can you stand up, buddy, just for a minute? Can you stand up for a minute? This is, this is my friend Jacob. And, and, I, and I, don't, I don't really know anyone who has more of a quality of life um, than Jacob. But the world would say that Jacob doesn't have a quality of life. But no one that I know of loves God and is willing to not, listen, he has no inhibitions. He knows every word to every song. He's an encourager. He knows when the Holy Spirit has, has showed up. He'll pray for people. He'll, I've seen him up here praying for people to get healed. And I love you for that. I do. Don't. He, he, and he mocks me out every service. It's the best. It's just the best. And so, and so but, I, but I, I wanted to say that, see, there's something about maturity that is not offended easily. There, there's something about a mature person. As you're growing more into Christ, you're okay with diversity. You're really, really okay with watching other people's expressions develop. I know that if I held Ariel to the same restrictions that I expect out of Nathan, that wouldn't be right. Ariel, first of all, she wouldn't be held. <laughs> so that's just when she's four and she's like, she's, I think she, I think she actually runs the house. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, but, but, but I just, but the beauty, see, I, out of all my children, none of them have been the same. And they all love God and express their love for God in different ways, in different seasons of their life. Sometimes they're closer to God and there's a, maybe a greater expression. Sometimes they're a little bit far away, but there's something of a heart that's still attached. And you thank him for those that they're still attached. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So you, you walk through and you stay steady, you stay steady. And as I've matured as a father, not only naturally, but spiritually of this house, I have, I have come to find that the value of a father is being stable. 
when people are going in and out, when people are challenged, when, when you have preferences and opinions, when you have people coming and bringing accusations about you and all these type of things. And I'm, and I, and I, I'm going to share this right now because it was amazing to me, but um, Richard Horsey this morning in the service, um, um, he, um, he, he, and I didn't know this until today, um, but he has actually been um, sharing some things with some other folks, um, saying some even in maybe inappropriate things about me to other people, untrue things, but, but evaluations and perspectives. And, uh, and this morning, um, we were, we were, he had a word from the Lord, which was amazing, but the word from the Lord that he had, he submitted it to Pastor Bob. And Pastor Bob says, go and share that word with the house. And see, the thing, the thing that's beautiful about when, when a person who is gifted and spiritual and has something from the Lord and, 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 and they really have a good word to share, that type of stuff, that word actually becomes powerful when it is under authority. Yeah. Because when a person will submit to the authority that's in the room or in the house or in the, in, at your workplace or whatever, that's actually when you get authority in the word that you're speaking. Yeah. And see, see, Jesus spoke the same words that the Pharisees and the Sadducees spoke. The difference was Jesus spoke words under authority. And so because he spoke words under authority, uh, he actually spoke with authority. And people think that Jesus was just subjected to his father. Can I tell you something? He said he was a servant of all. That means that he, was, he, he submitted himself to each and every one of us for a consideration that when he speaks into our life, we can actually say, I accept it or I reject it. But how can you reject such a great love when it's submitted to you with such love and such reverence and and it, it, what happens is it has a great authority in your life does that make sense so when Jesus said to his disciples how do we become the greatest in the kingdom he said then you've got to learn to be the least Jesus learned how to his there's no other there's no other name higher than Jesus none none on heaven or none on earth right am I correct right how did he get that how did he get the well done, good and faithful servant? How did he get the one that says that at, at his name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is gonna to confess that he is Lord? See, it's not a matter of if you're gonna confess that he's Lord. It's just a matter of when. See, if you do it willingly, willingly in the now, you get the blessing of a submitted life. But if you have to do it under the force, like the enemy's gonna see, because Satan himself is gonna bow his knee and his tongue. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God our Father. That's coming. So it's not a matter of whether you're going to do it. It's just a matter of when you're going to do it. And the when, if you do it in the now, by faith, you actually get the benefit of what faith releases from heaven because it's impossible to please God without faith. See, a lot of us only want to submit when we see the manifest authority in a person. Can I tell you something? When you submit to an authority because you trust God, you get the manifest authority faith manifests in your life and actually gets to work in your life. You, I got to go over here and talk for a while. I'm only talking over here because you guys are really cute. What else? You, what do you guys want to talk about? Oh, okay. So since I'm over here, Dale and Katie, I have a confession that I'd like to make to you guys. Um, in this journey that I've been on um, over the last... I don't know how many years, 10 years, 15 years, where I used to be afraid of everything from God. Can I tell you guys something? Um, in Hebrews, it says one of the foundational principles, Hebrews 6, is the resurrection of the dead. Can I, can I tell you guys something? Um, during the funeral service for Carter, um, I had a thought. Could we have them back? I had that thought. And so I went through and I said, well, this would be a great time, Carter. I'm thinking to myself, this would be a great time, buddy, um, if you just came back to us right, right now. Now, I say that because Pastor Scott's not crazy. Some other things I've said and done have been crazy, but this same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells with inside of me. And if the resurrection of the dead is a foundational principle, I want it. Okay, see here's, see, here's what it is. I, I feel like a lot of times people don't get the miracles in their life, and I'm talking about me, okay, because we're not ready for that miracle yet. Watch, Jesus' first miracle was not raising somebody from the dead. It was turning the water into wine, and he didn't even want to do it, but he had to submit to his mother. 
and then it happened. And then he did a few other things and he did a few other things, but he ended his life with actually resurrecting. Yes or no? Jesus resurrected. He, he exclamates his whole ministry on the fact of, I am the resurrection and the life. So I just wanna, I wanna encourage you that in this process, you may be struggling with this thing or that thing. You may be struggling with, you know, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that. What the Lord is saying in Hebrews 6 is, let's leave the discussions of theology. Let's leave the discussions of these foundational principles. Let's move on to something. Trust him with these things. Walk in repentance, walk in love, walk in hope, walk in all these things. You know, believe in the resurrection of the dead. But what we've done is we've, created a theology for the future that we're not willing to actually walk in now. See, if I were to ask you, do you believe that you're gonna resurrect someday from the dead if you first die and go into the grave? Most of you, if you were a Christian, would say, yes, I believe that when Jesus comes back, I'm gonna be resurrected. Every funeral I've ever gone to, they speak about the fact that that's our great hope. The hope that we have in Christ is, is that the dead in Christ are gonna rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are gonna be caught up in the air. And everybody says amen. But if I was to say that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and he actually has the ability to resurrect dead things now, we would be challenged. I would be challenged. So I wanted to say you know, to you guys that when we buried Carter on Friday and at the funeral home first, these things began to stir in me. And, and while we were at the, the grave site, Carter um, was eight, nine months old and he's with our father now, um, and uh, dancing and everything's amazing for him, but we were kind of hoping to keep him. And, uh, and this church fought in prayer and intercession to keep Carter, and I thank you for that. Thank you so much, because th- this, this church, um, we, 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 we rallied and became warriors for the sake of this young life. See, but the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, and I wanna tell you something. Um, if a person steals from you, that means they didn't get permission to take what, what, you, what, what they took. So if, for people that think that God allows destruction and devastation and that kind of stuff, well, I just wanna say something. God is a God, everything I read about God is that he's good, that he is love, that he is kind, right? And also, I, everything I read about God is the fact of all good things come from the Father of lights, all good things, okay? But there is an enemy that wants to steal from us. And I wanna tell you, God will take what the enemy steals and he'll turn it as a weapon against the enemy and for your good. There's no doubt about that. But I just don't, I have a difficult time blaming God as being an abusive God when it's the enemy who's actually doing the stealing, okay? So, but I wanted to tell you guys that with that, I just was, I was out there in the field and you guys, I believe, sensed it in that moment when we were invoking the Holy Spirit, and the wind just came up. I gotta be honest with you, man, I was waiting for the earth to start to shake. And I've never ever, in 51 years, I've ever had that sense so strong as, a, as not just a possibility, but as a probability that Carter's gonna awaken, that he was just sleeping. Now, the world, see the thing is, there's so many people that aren't ready to hear that, but can I tell you something? Hey, Dale, Katie, if I ever have one of my children laying there in a hospital bed, I want you guys praying for them. I want you guys praying for them. And I wanna tell you something. I want people like me around me declaring life over my child even though he's dead. That's the people. I don't want people that says, I don't want people to say this. Well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thanks, no thanks. I want somebody who actually knows who the Father really is, knows the power of his son Jesus. And let's look at this way, look at this way. I I keep people talking, well, you don't wanna give them false hope. Can I just tell you something? I'm not giving anybody false hope, but I like to have them them have some hope. Why don't we fight and fight and fight until we don't have to fight anymore? But what we do is we have a culture that says, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, must be God meant this to happen, and we lay down and we let the enemy walk all over us. I just, I think church, that he's looking for a church that actually will stand up. We're called believers. I think we probably actually ought to believe what he says. And I, 
and, I, and, I, and I'm gonna apologize without apologizing right now, but I apologize to you if that's the type of church that you don't want, but I, I wanna tell you that that is, that is absolutely the church that this church is becoming, is we're becoming a church in his likeness, and we're gonna pursue him, and we are gonna burn with everything that we have until what, until what? Until I see heaven come to earth. I'm not stopping. Earth doesn't satisfy me anymore. Burying babies, burying babies doesn't, it doesn't make me happy anymore. Um, watching kids commit suicide, it doesn't make me happy anymore. It doesn't, it, it's not just a task to do. It's not just a, a something to build a foundation around. It's actually something that you actually begin to believe that God actually can change the heart of a man, that God actually can change the heart of a culture, that God can actually change the heart of a people where we actually awaken up and we become a body that actually represents his DNA. Do I love his principles? I love his principles. But I wanna build on his principles, not camp on his principles. I, I, want to, I wanna build something amazing and great that will bring glory to him because the last I heard, he goes from glory to glory to glory to glory. But here's, man, here's the difficult, here's the difficult task is that you can't do it any other way but his way. I can't have preferences on what I want it to look like. I can't have preferences while, you know, I believe this and so that's the only thing. I can't, I've gotta be able to be teachable. I've gotta be able to be humble. I've gotta be able to be respectful. I've gotta be in a place of honor. I gotta be able to be willing to say, man, I actually can learn to love, watch this, unconditionally. No strings attached. So that when I actually pray, when I pray, you see, Maybe, maybe Dale and Katie, I'm not making this about me, but, but I, I, I think I'm moving to a place where I'm getting ready to see him resurrect marriages and see him resurrect people out of, out of, the, out of hospital beds, you know, see him resurrect dead dreams that people have and see him resurrect things. You know, I, I, I really wanna see miracles happen. The problem I'm having is I don't wanna have any reason for the miracle. Like, I hate the reasons. Like, why do I need a miracle? When I see a marriage struggling, I, I hate that, but I, but I wanna move to the place where it actually, where I look at that bad situation, I say, oh, this is just another opportunity for my good, good dad. I wish I was more ready for you guys. I'm not quitting until I am. And Carter did something inside of me that um, I pray never ends. His eyes, his spirit, his life, his resilience, his energy, his strength, his fight that he had. Um, I want that man. So Father, I ask that you just uh, forgive us um, when, wherever we've become complacent, God, wherever we have settled for less than your best, I pray, Father, that you, you, you awaken a resolve in us that says, you know, I'm tired of discussing religious activities. I'm, I'm tired of discussing theology. I, I'm really tired of discussing what I like and what I don't like. Father, I just want to keep my eyes so fixed on you that every day has an opportunity to make me look more like you. That's my hope. And as long as, Father, that we have breath, that we won't just believe in the resurrection to come, but that we'll live in the resurrection that is. Right now, in our hearing, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. Yes, sir.
And I, man, Pop, I absolutely believe that. I know, I know what shifted in myself. I know what shifted in so many people. And I know that his death uh, wasn't wasted. I know that. There's a great investment that happened in his mom and in his dad. Like I said, in Dale and in Katie, as well as grandparents, the, the whole family, Carter impacted people in eight, nine months that most people never impact that way in their whole lives. And I appreciate that. But there's something of a, there's a something of a, a holy discontent pop yeah. that's in me. Yeah. I just, I just want more. You know, I, and I don't, and I don't say that, I don't say that because I want to, you know, I want to have it, you know, a check in my belt or a check. I don't want, I'm not looking for, for that. I just, I just feel, I feel like God, God's image gets tainted by a bride who actually doesn't represent him for who he really is. And, and I don't want to fail in representing who he really is any longer because of my lack of unbelief. And I've been asking, Father, I believe, but help me in my unbelief in these things. Help adjust me. Help, help. And listen, I don't, I don't want anyone to hear condemnation, but I just, I want, it, I, I want that conviction on me that keeps me pressing towards that mark of a higher calling rather than settling settling for a theology that will say that God just isn't that. Do you, do you know what I mean? And, and, and it seems like we always bury our theology. But it seems like Jesus would take death and use it as an opportunity to, to increase people's faith like he did with Lazarus or like when he stopped that funeral procession. And I know they all sound like good stories, but I think he modeled something for his church that actually we would represent the father the same way that Jesus represented the father because if Jesus only did what his father did and only said what his father said and he says that we're gonna do greater things, then we ought to be able to be engaged with the same type of lifestyle that Jesus walked on the earth. And so he didn't look at death as an end. He looked at it as an opportunity to instill life. I try to think I'm practical, you know? I try to think that I, I really only want the legitimate and the authentic, and I really, I really, I believe that's in my DNA. Be, uh, to, to, I'm not looking for show, you know? I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for this big um, hoopla type of thing. But I don't believe, I don't believe that you get what Jesus had unless you're moved with compassion. And he was moved with compassion for people, man. And out of that compassion and out of that submission to the Father, great things came into a world that actually stood back. And when he's hanging on the cross in his final moments, they said, wow, surely he must have been the son of God. I just, I guess I, I just want the things to die in me that need to die so that the things in me that need to live can live. So you guys just pray for me for a minute and I'll pray for you for a minute. Father, I, um, I ask that everything, everything in us that needs to die, every offended place, every, every hurt place, um, every preference, Father, anything of, um, that we're, 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 any box that we have created to try to keep you in and take you out when it's convenient. Father, I ask for all those things just to be broken down. Father, I ask that, that something in each one of us, genuine, real, um, that we can take maybe from somebody else's encounter, somebody else's experience, somebody else's testimony, or maybe just our own. Maybe you're just drawing us individually right now ourselves, but, but would you um, stop anything that would keep us, any theology that would keep us, any mindset that would keep us from an actual genuine encounter, a relationship building time that we could have with you where everything that we've heard, whether we agree with it or not, could be set aside. Every thought that we may have had, agreed with it or not, that we could just set aside. Every thought, good or bad, we can just take it captive right for a moment. And Father, would your voice be so clear right now? And uh, would, you, would you just meet us and then call us and then draw us to yourself? We stand in a place where we, man, we just, we want our mindset to be set solely on you.
that would just be this moment. And while every head's bowed and every, every eye is closed, man, I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you right up front, I'm not, I'm gonna keep this completely personal between you and me. Um, but I feel like I need to just do this, that if you, you know, if today became a brand new day for you because you just heard his voice calling you saying, hey, what Pastor Scott's saying is true, and you actually would like to begin your relationship with him today, if that's you, will you just look up at me? I'm gonna look to my left, your right. Just look up at me. No one else looking around, man. No one else looking around. Yes, sir. Looking to my left, to the center, left center, if that's you, man. I'm not gonna call you up front. We're not gonna do anything. No one else is gonna know between God, me, and you. Yes, ma'am. In the center now. I'm in the center. Just have your eyes Meet mine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Now I'm over to my right. If that's you, just have your eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just have your eyes meet mine. Thank you. Your eyes meet mine. Your eyes meet mine. Man, don't go another day. The best decision you ever make for him, man. Thank you. Over to my right. Father, I pray for the dozen or so here this morning that just decided to step into your kingdom. I got to tell you that, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a minute. Those of you who did, um, you really are going to need to pursue and go after and dig and find people in this house that will love you and engage with you and that type of stuff. So start, you know, call this office this week, call this church, and we will get you connected with somebody. But do not allow this moment to slip away from you and just think that it was an emotional moment. This was not an emotional moment. This was a moment that changes the course of history for you. I'm available. Anyone on our staff is available. Any of our connect group leaders are available. Any of our volunteers are available. They will love on you and they will walk through with you. They'll spend the next couple of months just getting you on a course, a trajectory, if you would, that will take you into your destiny purpose because every single one of you have a destiny. Every single one of you have a purpose. Every one of you I know have a dream. And I believe that God is in the moment right now resurrecting dreams all over this house. Don't let your dream be robbed. Let that person, that, that enemy who's been stealing from you, let him steal no, no longer. In Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you. We worship you. We love you. We adore you. And we're so, so glad that today began a brand new day for so many. There's been so many that have been looking for years. They've been watching for years. And, and just with a, I don't want to say a critical eye, but a critiquing eye. But today, they stepped over. <laughs> um, let me put it another way. I believe the angel rolled that stone away and just sat down on it and said, that thing that used to stop you no longer hinders you. Congratulations and welcome to the greatest adventure on earth following the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we just give them a hand this morning, you guys? Can we give them a hand? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. So here's what we're gonna do. We end the service this way. Every service, it's not weird. This is just what we do. We begin with worship. We end with worship. And then right after worship, we pray. And we pray one for another. That's just normal. When you come into a church, you should always, you should always worship. You should always hear the word and you should always pray. That's the normal things that churches do. So we just want to take and we want to have you, if you would, just stand right now. And if we could have those that would like to minister around the altar or be ministered to while worship is going on, you come here and you tell somebody about what happened today. You share with them what happened today. If you have questions about what you heard, you come and let those questions be answered. But there are great men and women here that will minister to you, that will 
will love on you, that will engage with you, and, and, and non-pushy, they'll just invite you in to a kingdom that has no end. If you need a word spoken over your life, a word of encouragement, you need healing physically, you need, you need any, anything at all, don't walk out of here today without being engaged with something of heaven coming to earth on your behalf. In Jesus' name, let's worship him one more time.